This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Thank you and, uh, and welcome. Um, the sheet will be passed around, as will the uh, large bowl of crisps. Just to warn you in relation to both of these that, and everything else, that this occasion is being filmed. So uh, there may be some research on the number of sandwiches eaten by different people in the room. Um, I am uh, honoured to be standing in instead of uh, the Dean who is elsewhere today. I'm, I'm up on the show, I'm uh, at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. Um, and I'm uh, honoured to be introducing Professor James Manner. Um, he's going to talk about the bricks, he says, but he seems to have lost his R. Um, at some point in, uh, in the system, and mainly he's going to be talking about Brazil, India, China, and South Africa. And then you've come to listen to him, so I will shut up. James. Thank you. Russia is not included in this list of BRICS because the trends I will talk about have not developed in Russia, they've developed elsewhere. Uh, we in the West, in North America, in Europe, and even in Japan, uh, have understandably been preoccupied in, in recent times with the economic crisis and the contraction of social programs that uh, address poverty and inequality in our countries. Uh, but this has caused us to overlook an immensely important counter-trend, largely ignored by the media and even by researchers in the West. And the counter-trend is the substantial increase over the last 10 years in government efforts to tackle poverty and inequality in Brazil, India, China, and South Africa. Since Brazil begins with the letters BR, we continue to use the word BRIC, but it doesn't mean Russia is in there. To give you one example of the increased spending I'm talking about, in, in its first term in power between 2004 and 2009, the current ruling coalition of parties in India spent over $57 billion, uh, that's serious money, on poverty programs. That is vastly in excess of such spending by any previous Indian government. Substantial uh, increases also occurred in Brazil and in China over that period, over the last decade. The South Africans lag a bit, but significant change has also happened there. So uh, since th th these four countries contain almost half of humankind, they increasingly set international agendas, uh, both within the four regions where they are the leading presence, but also globally. Uh, and this trend, therefore, cries out for analysis. It's astonishing that the Western media have missed it. Now, my talk today looks a little more closely at the trend and explains how a large team of international researchers uh, from the School of Advanced Study and from partner institutions around the world are investigating the trend. When you look at the four cases, you might expect that they would break down into two groups, one group of three, democracies, Brazil, India, uh, and South Africa, and then a, a second, not a group, but an individual case, China, an autocracy. But no. Instead, the four break down into pairs when you look at, uh, when you try to understand why the trend has developed in these cases. On the one hand, you have Brazil and India together. On the other hand, you have China and South Africa together. I need to explain this. Brazil and India are places where elections are competitive, which means that ruling parties sometimes lose. In India, ruling parties usually lose. Uh, and in those countries, poor people have a lot of votes. And in a reversal of the predominant pattern in the Western democracies, uh, in these, in, in South Africa and India and Brazil, 
uh, a greater proportion of poor voters turn out to vote than do prosperous voters in Britain, in America, in New Zealand, and so on, in France. It, middle class people vote in a larger proportion of the middle class votes than of the working class in uh, India and Brazil, and also we know South Africa. The, the pattern is the opposite. So a lot of votes come from poor people. And therefore, senior politicians in India and Brazil have made efforts to tackle poverty and inequality in order to win votes, in order to cultivate popularity. Votes from the vast numbers of poorer people, but also votes from people uh, who um, sympathize with poverty reduction programs. In China and South Africa, things are different. In China, uh, votes are unnecessary. In South Africa, they have free and fair elections, but the ruling African National Congress will be assured of victory in national elections uh, and in nearly all the states of that federal system for several years to come, no matter what the government does. What worries the Chinese is the rising tide of collective protests that they have seen in recent years. And we don't, we don't have to look any further than the Chinese government's own official statistics to understand how serious these protests have been. Uh, by their numbers, in 2005, there were 80,000 collective protests across China. By their numbers, in 2010, there were 100, over 100,000 collective, serious collective protests across China. This is a huge number of protests. This is far more collective protests than you see in India in those same years. And in India, collective protest is a kind of art form. Uh, so the same thing, the, the, the thing that really worries the Chinese is what they call instability. Um, and the same thing is what really worries the South Africans. Uh, last June, I gave a lecture in Johannesburg to explain India's and also the world's largest poverty program, which is the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. And I did this because the South African government was considering trying something similar in South Africa. And the discussant at my talk was, <coughs> uh, remarkably, the head, the, the, the general secretary, of COSATU, the Congress of South African Trade Unions, which is the TUC, as it were, of South Africa. Um, the Co COSATU is part of the ruling ANC, uh, and uh, I have to say that th this man, the discussant's comments were far more interesting than my lecture was. He got up and gave a rip-snorting 10-minute sermon about how the cities, the comfortable cities of South Africa, were surrounded by rings of fire. Rings of fire that, were, that consisted of violent and um, massive protests constantly happening in the uh, townships and in the slum squatter settlements surrounding the major city. It was a, it was a stem winding presentation and he stressed instability because he wanted the government to adopt a scheme similar to the one that I was describing in India and to adopt other poverty programs. So in South Africa and China, they're worried about instability. In India and Brazil, they're worried, worried about getting votes. And from those differences flow other differences in the way they developed their uh, poverty programs and inequality programs. We have a team, we formed a team of 18 scholars, which will be coordinated out of the uh, School of Advanced Study and it will work in concert with a small, smaller team in Canada. We're just beginning an, our assessment of this, uh, this trend. We will analyze how the trend emerged, what political and policy processes drove the change, and what that tells us about the world we live in. And that, of course, implies what it tells us about ourselves. Now, how do we analyze this topic? We start with senior politicians because they have immense influence. 
They almost always make most of the key decisions about their government's policies and political strategies. So if you want to understand why these four governments have changed their policies, we have to begin with these powerful people at the top. Now that may sound obvious to you, certainly sounds obvious to me, but strangely, the political science literature uh, de-emphasizes or even omits politicians from its analysis of this kind of thing. And so does the, much of the development literature. Now what that, those literatures give us is Hamlet without the prince. We are going to bring the prince back in, senior politicians back in. We will look at the political perceptions, the po senior politicians' political perceptions, calculations, machinations, and, and also their presentations of themselves, uh, which is, is to say we'll be looking at political theatrics. Uh, do they present themselves in a low-key way? Uh, do they, they advertise and push these policies in a high profile or even in a bombastic manner? Do they conceal the new policies that they're introducing? Sometimes you get reform by stealth. And so we'll be looking at perceptions, calculations, machinations, and presentations. We'll also be looking at their ideological commitments, if any. Uh, actually, many, probably most politicians in less developed countries, and most politicians in these four countries have little or no ideological commitment in truth, whatever they say for public purpose. But such, it is not necessary for these politicians to be ideologically committed to poverty reduction in order for us to see poverty reduction. Sometimes they act for other reasons. We will, we will be looking at their assessments of potential poverty programs, political, financial, and administrative feasibility. Feasibility is actually quite important. We need to, um, we, we will look at the way they answer certain questions like these. Will it be possible politically to sell a poverty program to a whole range of political actors in my country? Uh, second, can the government's budget bear the cost of the program? Third, does the government's administrative structure have the capacity to actually implement this program to reduce poverty or inequality? And we'll also have to study the assessment, their assessment, of what is politically necessary, given the problems that they face, what must they do to survive and enhance their influence, and also their assessment of whether a poverty program or a program to reduce inequality is politically advantageous. Will a program, poverty program, serve their political interests? That's a very important question because that, unlike ideology, is, the, is uppermost in the minds of the politicians that we're looking at. Uh, there are variations um, in uh, leaders' perceptions alongside, sitting alongside the realities, perceptions of government's fiscal administrative capacity uh, and administrative capacity or incapacity. And these uh, perceptions are quite important because they shape the way that things happen. Uh, for example, I'll, I'll give you a few examples. Government revenues have ris risen significantly in recent years in all four of these countries, especially in India, India where the increase has been spectacular but also in the others. However, South African opponents of social policies, poverty reduction policies, and I should say that the opponents of such policies uh, in South Africa are stronger than the opponents in the other three countries. And South African opponents of social policies use doubts about both the fiscal um, capacity uh, of the state and the administrative capacity, the, the capacity of the administrative structures to actually make the poverty programs work, they use these doubts to argue against any new initiatives. There is considerable resistance to the man who stood up and said there was a ring of fire uh, around the major cities of South Africa. 
In India, um, on the other hand, there's considerable skepticism about the administrative capacity, the condition of the bureaucracy, whether it's up to the job of implementing program to reduce poverty and inequality. And that inspires a different sort of argument, not resistance necessarily, but an argument that the best way to reduce poverty is through direct cash transfers to poor people, which are administratively easy. They don't require bureaucratic input. The Chinese leaders are, have a different view again. They are cool to the idea of demand-driven programs which encourage popular participation from the bottom up, the kind of programs we see a lot of in India and Brazil. Um, so they tend to resist such programs since they smack of democracy. But the Chinese leaders have great confidence in the in this capacity of the state structures that they've created. Uh, and in, especially in this capacity to implement top-down programs. And they have strong appetites for top-down control and therefore top-down programs. Brazil's unique success in reducing inequality amid economic growth, uh, this is something that's extremely difficult to do because growth tends to make inequality worse. Its success at reducing inequality amid economic growth has bred confidence among Brazilian leaders about the likely success of almost any kind of poverty program or any anti-inequality program they undertake. So there's very little hesitation about trying things there. Um, three of the four governments inherited habits and commitments from previous governments which impeded new initiatives to tackle poverty and inequality. Only in Lula da Silva's Brazil was the inheritance from the previous government mostly helpful. Uh, there were, in the other three cases, the inheritance was not helpful. And yet, in all four, uh, we see new initiatives emerging to tackle poverty and inequality. In other words, innovative political entrepreneurship, innovative political agency, fancy word we use to describe actions by leaders, innovative political agency is a key theme in this study. Um, innovative political entrepreneurship in three out of four of these cases has prevailed over path dependency. I better explain a little bit about that, this, because this is, this is a key theoretical point when we encounter the political science literature again. That literature would have us believe that path dependency, which implies the avoidance of change or the impossibility of change because old habits persist, path dependency uh, is, is, we are told by the literature, often an insurmountable impediment to policy change. Now, three of the four cases that we're studying, major cases, indicate that that argument is unsound at least unsound in, in our, our era. Times may have changed for complicated reasons, for example, as revenues increase in these countries. The study that we are now uh, undertaking will proceed in two phases. First, uh, in phase one, we have four country teams consisting of country specialists uh, in the four cases. Each team can, contains academics from different, different disciplines, plus one person who is a scholar practitioner. Um, that is to say, a person who has significant analytical ability. In fact, I think all four have doctorates. Um, but who is also involved, has been involved, and maybe still is involved, as an actor of some description, a significant actor in the political and policy process. We have, for example, in India, the most distinguished retired civil servant uh, of the last generation, Dr. N.C. Saxena, who uh, was the secretary of, uh, mem member secretary of the Planning Commission and various other things, um, but he also has a, a DPhil from Oxford uh, in the study of development and, and the politics of development. Uh, we have a, a man in China who was a, a 
heads a, an institute that gives advice to the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, but who's also a very distinguished uh, political sociologist. And so it goes on. Anyway, these scholar practitioners will link us to the real world, to real world actors from whom we will want to get evidence in interviews, and it, they will help us to feed our findings back to these people uh, who work in the political and the policy communities. In the first phase, each country team will do a systematic investigation of a single country uh, using similar sets of questions across the four countries. Then in phase two, we compare the four cases. And the 18-member team can, contains many people uh, who have a very significant experience at comparative analysis. For example, um, Jude Howell from LSE uh, headed uh, a huge initiative that the Economic and Social Research Council undertook on uh, uh, civil society, or what they called uh, uh, non-governmental public actors. Um, entailing all kinds of comparisons across countries. Uh, another member of the team, Sarah Cook, is the uh, director of UNRIS, the United Nations Research Institute on Social Development, which constantly does comparative work, etc. Finally, uh, we will take our four cases and examine them alongside some negative cases where what, what we see in the four countries doesn't, has not happened. We will look at Pakistan, Argentina, and Nigeria, where this trend that we're studying has not developed. And we do this because in negative cases, this is something you might find helpful if you plan a research project someday, negative cases will help us to see what enables successful cases to be successful. There are usually some, you can usually find some contrasts that, that apply across the board. Um, we will explain how in the four countries social programs have, contrary to the received wisdom and some of the literature, how they have proved feasible politically, economically, and administratively, as I say. And we will also seek to confirm what on present evidence, present evidence looks likely to be true. And that is that programs to tackle poverty and inequality are politically beneficial to governments that create the programs. They are vote winners if you need votes, and they tend to reduce instability if that's your problem. Um, we also, uh, sorry, I'm going to go on with one more buzzword from the, uh, the development studies literature. We will also uh, show, I, we, we seek to show, that uh, policies and programs to reduce poverty and inequality lend themselves to what a big, a big buzzword, sustainability, because efforts to tackle poverty and inequality enhance the political and economic sustainability of regimes. They enhance the sustainability of economic growth, and they enhance constructive uh, the sustainability of constructive development strategies. Um, now, there is a, I could sort of get deeper into something that may, you may find slightly tedious, so let me just mention it and then not get into it, and you can bring me back to it if this is your passion. <laughs> Initiatives to tackle poverty and the inequality, this, uh, this phrase I keep using, can mean uh, the pursuit of, of four different kinds of goals. Um, and if you're interested in what those might be, I can get into it, but I think I'll, I'll pass over it, if I may, uh, since it may bore you stiff. Um, we will also pay attention to government's preoccupations with poverty as opposed to inequality, or vice versa, because um, attacking poverty is not exactly the same thing as attacking inequality, uh, because variations in emphasis, whether your target is poverty or inequality, variations in emphasis affect political and policy processes, political and policy choices. Um, 
We will also pay attention to the distinction between poverty and inequality because tackling one or the other problem um, may entail different political strategies and addressing one of these problems may actually make the other problem worse. If you seek, uh, for example, if you seek to reduce poverty by going all out for economic growth, which clearly is one way to reduce poverty, there are other. If you, uh, if you go all out for growth, you will reduce poverty, you will reduce the number of people living in poverty, but you will also increase the inequality, you are likely to increase inequality in your country. The Chinese, since 1979, have lifted more people out of poverty than any uh, sizable country has ever done in the same period, over the same uh, length of time in human history. That's great, they reduced poverty. The gro growth has reduced poverty. At the same time, the Chinese have gone from, have, have transformed their country from being one of the most equal countries in the world to being one of the most unequal countries in the world. So the pursuit of poverty, headlong, all out, typically Chinese, headlong pursuit of poverty uh, has in fact caused a spectacular increase in inequality. Um, a couple of final thoughts. I don't want to go on too long because I think we might learn more from the discussion. Um, this project challenges the assumption that we live in an era in which social programs only contract, in which the rolling back of the state proceeds apace, and in which governments are caught up in a race to the bottom. That's a picture that we get if we look at North America and Europe. But there's another side of the story. This project is about the other side of the story. And one last thing. I suggested that this trend may tell us something about ourselves in the industrialized countries of the West. We're beginning to hear a narrative of recent events which comes from countries like Brazil, India, China, and South Africa. And it often refers with such some pride to economic growth in those countries, and at the same time, of course, to economic crisis in the West. Uh, for example, last week I had an email from a uh, distinguished Indian economist. It went to all, the email went to all kinds of people, arguing that since the BRICS economies would soon equal or outweigh those in the West, so, he argued, the next president of the World Bank should be somebody from the BRICS and not an American as it has always been, and frankly, as it is likely to be. Uh, and then, as if to emphasize this point, yesterday, on the BBC World Service, they announced that Brazil, Brazil's economy had overtaken Britain's in size. The narrative that we're hearing also connects to the trend that I've been describing, to the increased efforts in the BRIC to tackle poverty and inequality, at a time when such efforts in the West are waning. We hear people say, um, people from the BRICS, that part of the relative decline of the West is a tendency towards self-harm. Western economies are in severe recession. We know from a prominent figure in recent Western history, John Maynard Keynes, who lived a few hundred yards from here, that when a severe recession occurs, you do not slash spending. Instead, you should paradoxically increase government spending to stimulate the economy. One sign, we are told, from the BRICS, one sign of the tendency towards self-harm in the West is the slashing of government spending. Leaders in Berlin, the Republican Party in the United States, have rejected the insights of Keynes. Indeed, leaders in his own country have rejected them, with gusto, by imposing more extreme spending cuts than any similar country has ever attempted before. That's what's happening right here 
These leaders are treading the same path that Herbert Hoover took in 1929, cutting spending in the teeth of a severe recession, which tipped the United States, of which he was president, by the way, in case you haven't heard his name before, and it tipped the United States and the world into the Great Depression. There are no glowing memorials to Herbert Hoover in the United States. People who follow his example are likely to end up being despised, as he is. Now, those voices from the bricks are saying that one key sign of the tendency towards self-harm in the West is this tendency to forget its own history and the lessons which, it, which emerged from, from that history. And they, this drive to reduce efforts to tackle poverty and inequality in the West is happening at the worst possible time, at a time when the economic crisis is making more people poor and increasing the need for social programs. It's no accident, by the way, that uh, the most eloquent statement of this argument appeared uh, about four months ago, uh, the most eloquent statement to appear in Britain, appeared in the in an article in The Guardian by a professor from the Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi. Voices from the BRICS are saying that current policies in the West add up to a recipe for political trouble, for what the Chinese and the South Africans call instability. I could go on, but the list of uh, uh, worries that they're ex expressing is already fairly alarming. Now, it remains to be seen whether this voice that these voices are correct in their interpretation. Um, but I think we should, at, at the very least, listen and consider what they have to say. Thanks. Well, James has been uh, kind enough to, uh, to invite a comment. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Just a couple, couple points. I guess um, I think the project is really interesting. It's really the universal thesis that you use focusing on the works, and you, you mentioned Keynes. Um, in a way, I mean, someone might argue, right, that the piece selection that you've used is kind of a, it could be explained just through you know, structural transformation. So these these countries are pursuing public forms of Keynesianism, whereas in you know Western Europe or even in the United States, people there have been articles written about how these countries are um, you know experiencing a contraction in social protection precisely because they uh, pursue privatized Keynesianism. Um, so it's privatized Keynesianism. Privatized Keynesianism. What is that? Uh, you know, sort of state financed, um, or I suppose state encouraged policies that encourage you know, privatized lending and privatized spending. But you know, there is kind of this idea that the state, think, you know, as we've seen in the banking crisis, will be the, the last one holding the bag. Um, and then I think the second point, I think you mentioned um, Sarah Copeland and, and Andres, and they. They also they, they they did a multi-million dollar study, which I'm, you probably have looked into, um, which you know is, takes a different approach, right? Because they they kind of looked at um, Botswana and um, Kerala and Costa Rica as sort of these outlier cases where you know to make the point that um, constrained physical spaces, countries with low levels of economic development, can still pursue universal social policies. So I think that it would be maybe good uh, to maybe see how those sort of differentiations could, could work between this project and their larger project. Because they also have the brick cases in there as well. But you know, their angle was that um, brick cases are able to expand social protection precisely because they're undergoing a form of um, you know, industrial structural transformation. So the question in Europe is that, well, in a post-industrial, you know, growth regime, how does that kind of that estimate that there's some three worlds of welfare kind of um, debate? Okay, I, I think uh, the um, 
But the concept of privatized Keynesianism uh, and the explanation for, to identify it, which you then provided, I think this, this would, John Maynard Keynes would find this, he would be a stranger to this idea. I think this this um, is a slight, this concept probably entails a certain amount of sleight of hand, um, calling something by the opposite of its real name. But I'd have to look. I, I, this is a new and, and rather bizarre concept that I'd have to look at more and more carefully. Um, it's true that the four countries I'm looking at, and, and some other countries have undergone social trend, a structural transformation and, and, and a, you know, in, in terms of industrialization, in terms of uh, levels of economic growth, urbanization, etc., etc. Um, but in order for the kind of trends we're, we're studying to develop, uh, somebody has to decide to pursue the policies that we're, we're studying. It uh, doesn't just happen automatically as a result of structural transformation. And some countries which have experienced such, such structural transformation have, in fact, not um, taken the decisions that we're, we're looking at. So uh, although we're sure that uh, you know, these changes, urbanization, industrialization, uh, economic growth, and, and crucially, the expansion of state uh, of government revenue, uh, we're quite sure these are important. We don't think that they're, they actually explain what we're seeing. They enable what we're seeing. They set the uh, context which makes it possible for uh, these decisions to take place. But they don't uh, shape the... Uh, <clears throat> they, don't, they don't actually bring them into being. Um, uh, the study of Botswana, Kerala, and Costa Rica. Um, I'm very tired of uh, studies of places where things go beautifully and swimmingly uh, because of uh, circumstances that are so eccentric that one cannot expect them to have much application beyond these areas. Uh, we often hear about um, experiments in places like Porto Alegre, Brazil, for example, in the same breath as we hear these other cases mentioned. Uh, these are inspiring stories of uh, progressive politics and progressive policy coming together and producing good results. Um, but they cannot be replicated in most of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. They cannot be replicated even in, in, in the vast majority of India, of which Kerala is a part, and they cannot be replicated in parts of Brazil, of which Porto Alegre is a part. Um, these, these uh, we, we've had an awful lot of um, um, attention given to these places by frustrated progressives uh, who want to write sermons that inspire us uh, to believe that change for the better can happen, rather than serious analyses of what happens over very large areas. Botswana is the, squeak, the squeakiest, cl cleanest country in Africa. For complicated reasons, it has a political system unlike any other. Corruption is very uh, tightly uh, limit controlled in, in Botswana. Uh, the same cannot be said of any other part of Africa any other part, including South Africa. And um, uh, therefore, in a sense, what we learn from Botswana is almost entirely unhelpful in, uh, in deciding what might be possible or what is happening in the rest of Africa. Costa Rica is a similar kind of country. It's the only country in Latin America that doesn't have, it's the only country in the Americas, one of the few countries in the whole world that doesn't have an army, for example. It's a very eccentric kind of country with an eccentric history. And again, what happens in Costa Rica, can't, you cannot expect to replicate it elsewhere. Kerala is the only region of South Asia, former British India, including Pakistan and Bangladesh. It's the only region in which the, the pre-existing uh, socioeconomic order broke down. It broke down in the 19th century. Kerala had, is eccentric because it has uh, its dominant caste in the 19th century was a caste uh, which was uh, Governance properties based on matrilineal uh, arrangements. Matri the matrilineal system that existed in Kerala could not cope with the coming of modern capitalism. The dominant caste broke down and the whole social order cracked, cracked open. This happened in no other part of South Asia, including what we now call Bangladesh and Pakistan. Um, so it's, it's an ex extremely eccentric place uh, in South Asia. 
because the system cracked open, the old order broke down, all kinds of radical ideas and movements came into play. Uh, and uh, so that for complicated reasons, this led to very high levels of literacy, spectacularly, you know, the same levels, levels of literacy exist in Kerala as exist in the United Kingdom. And the rest of India is, is bumping along at about 60% literacy. So um, things are possible in Kerala, which are completely unthinkable in, in, in any other region of India, including, you know, the most progressive and accomplished one. So I think um, UNRIS study, we, we will use what we can of the data, but the case selection that they have made uh, is so uh, unhelpful because these are such eccentric places uh, that we don't expect to get a lot from it. Uh, on the other hand, selecting India as a whole, China as a whole, Brazil, and South Africa, that those are uh, you have all sorts of troubled places as well as inspiring places within those various universes. So we think our case selection will be more helpful to understanding the developing world in general. Thank you. Uh, just, uh, just to pick up on the last point on Kerala, uh, there is also the fact that this breakdown of the social order uh, took place within the context of Indian federalism. So it is the, the, the peculiarity of uh, Kerala combined with the uh, political circumstances of Indian federalism that made the transformation possible. I mean, uh, if uh, in uh, the uh, uh, Diwan of Travancore, uh, uh, Sir Siti Ramaswamy Hayer had his way and Travancore became independent, uh, the history could have been very, very different. Uh, but the point uh, I wanted to uh, draw attention to was the pairing that we start with of, uh, uh, of states and the distinction uh, between politicians seeking votes and politicians concerned with instability. Uh, I think what we are likely to see is that, in fact, in at least three of the four cases, uh, politicians are both seeking votes and addressing instability. Uh, because uh, certainly in India, uh, as well as the search for votes, uh, some, at least part of the poverty alleviation uh, programs are at least justified, if not prompted, by a, the need to address the instability arising, for instance, from the Maoist rebellions in uh, uh, large tracts of uh, tribal India in particular. And I think we might discern some of the same kind uh, uh, in, in the South African case, uh, increasingly the need to get votes as well as be concerned about instability as the political opposition uh, over time becomes more significant. So uh, I think I just wanted to put that in. Yeah, I should say and explain that James is one of the 18 members of this team. He's also from Kerala. So, uh, I should have let him answer the previous question on Kerala. Um, I agree, uh, it's not a question of either or, it's really a question of degree as to whether you emphasize um, the, the pursuit of votes or the pursuit of, of stability, uh, and the, it's a matter of emphasis. And as you're suggesting, if the conditions change, if the African National Congress starts getting close to losing elections, then the emphasis there might shift to votes away from instability. Uh, but for the moment, I think the emphasis there is on instability. And um, uh, the, the emphasis that you select for, on votes or instability affects the kinds of programs that you choose and develop and so on. Hi, um, so as you said, economic development and poverty alleviation are in particular. And one of the theories for that is urban bias. Um, sort of forward by election. And um, so I know what China and India have done towards that, but I don't know what Brazil 
and um, South Africa have done two sort of held that. Um, could you possibly mention a few things about that? This, this is very complicated. Um, Mike Lincoln <coughs> wrote a book quite a long time ago, about 25 years ago, but it's an important book, uh, on uh, arguing that um, governments in all over Africa, Asia, Latin America tend to have an urban bias and they tend to be, uh, um, this tends to produce uh, any injustice towards rural dwellers and also uh, it tends to increase poverty in rural areas. Um, we, when, when you start talking about this, is these issues, the issues that Lipton is, uh, is looking at, when you look at these four countries, then, then you get into very complicated territory because uh, India, for example, is still predominantly rural. Two-thirds of the Indians of the census of 2011 live in, in rural areas. Brazil is predominantly uh, urban. China is becoming, uh, is now, I think, has just tipped over to become, uh, to the point where more people live in urban areas than live in rural areas. And South Africa has, has a substantial number of has a very large urban sector as well. I can't remember the precise percentage. The deepest poverty in South Africa is in the rural areas. The deepest poverty in some of these other countries is not necessarily in the rural areas. So, so it's, uh, you know, the, the conditions of the unemployed 200 million who have sh sh shifted from the land to the cities in China over the last 20 years. This is an unbelievable number of people. The unemployed among the 200 million who have urbanized, um, live in uh, very wretched conditions, often without uh, papers that enable them to get basic services. And things. So in, in China, some of the worst poverty is urban. So that, in a way, what Lipton does is he gives us a set of questions to bring into this analysis. But the answers we get from the different cases are really quite different. And so um, at this point, we don't have any great generalization to, to offer that would be. So what have been the policies to alleviate poverty? Because that's the major obstacle, and if they have overcome that, then what, what are they? What are the policies that they have? We don't think that uh, Lipton has, has entirely captured the, the main, the list of reasons why uh, attempts at poverty reduction or reducing inequality don't happen. Um, because Lipton is, is a world class economist writing at a quite an early stage. We are predominantly political scientists who look at um, uh, the political and policy processes that lead to, um, that are involved in, in this, this, this exercise. And so um, our concerns are slightly different and I think we can come up with insights that no, not even the very best economic analysis, and his is among the best, uh, can come up with. But um, we will profit from, from his analysis and carry it a, a bit further. Um, we think that um, in most cases, um, the non-occurrence uh, the, the non of attempts to reduce poverty and inequality are the results of um, <coughs> organized interests uh, and who are able in the pre-interplay of ideas and interests in pursuit of power, which is what we call politics, uh, organized interests are able to thwart um, serious attempts at poverty reduction, inequality programs, and so on, in Nigeria, Pakistan, Argentina, etc. I don't know if I've actually answered your question, but I think I did. <laughs> well, you have answered my uh, just part of it, but it, 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 I, was, I was just wanting to ask about what your ideas or impressions are in relation to what are the core of the dis discrepancy, or perceived discrepancy, between uh, poverty reduction pro programs and the reduction of in inequality, uh, specifically in, in the case of the BRIC countries? And whether, indeed, I'm sure there's very sophisticated and, and elaborate economic explanations behind all of this, but I will be interested in hearing, in hearing more about the political side of it, but especially in terms of ideology, uh, whether that actually plays any role in, 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 in the process and the, the type of uh, policy procedures and political institutions that actually break into effect, into effect these, these policies. Yeah, well, the, the political, the procedures that bring into 
bring these policies into being is, in a sense, the subject of our research project, and it's a, a huge topic. So let me try to confine myself just to uh, an inadequate answer to maybe some of what you just asked about. Um, the, um, the question of how one pursues poverty reduction and how one seeks to reduce inequality, um, it's, it's, we're still working on this. It's extremely complicated. Uh, and uh, we don't have a nice, tidy little uh, summation to give you. Um, but let me try to uh, illustrate the kind of issue that might be, uh, might come up as we discuss that by talking about uh, four different goals that you can, um, you can pursue if you are trying to reduce poverty and or inequality. Right? Now, one thing you can do is you can, one strategy that you can um, uh, adopt is, is, uh, is the pursuit of economic growth which will lift some people, or maybe a lot of people, out of poverty. Uh, a second way is enhancing the productive capacity of poor people by giving them better education, better health care, uh, better nutrition, uh, etc., so they become capable of being more productive in the economy. Uh, uh, but they, as they become more capable, poverty, their poverty tends to be reduced, and inequality may be reduced between them and other people. Uh, redistributing income through taxes and transfers is a third way to tackle poverty and inequality. And the fourth way, uh, and we only have a list of four at this point, is empowering poor people and bolstering their political capacity, by which we mean four things. We mean their political awareness, political confidence, as, operative, as operators in the public sphere, their political skills, and their political connections. And we usually, the, the, the pursuit of empowerment usually means the creation of open arenas in which people, in which participatory politics, possibly elected local councils, or possibly uh, participatory politics in which don't entail elections, take place. Now, if you're pursuing the first of these goals, these goals, economic growth, then the evidence is fairly clear that this can lift a lot of people out of poverty, so it's quite good at tackling poverty. Uh, poverty defined in economic terms. There are other ways to define it, that I'll get to in a moment. But, but it, it's not a very good way to tackle inequality because when you have growth, you often get uh, inequality rising at the same time. However, uh, if you try to enhance in, uh, the productive capacity of poor people by providing nutrition, food, um, health care, etc., that tends to reduce both poverty and inequality. Um, so we think in any case. And if you're redistributing income through taxes and transfers, uh, this is the classic way to tackle inequality, and it also tends to tackle poverty. If you're taking a lot of taxes from prosperous people and redistributing them to poorer people, you are in fact uh, attacking in economic inequality. It's, just, it's a straight up and down assault on that. Finally, empowering poor people and bolstering their political capacity, this tends to reduce, in our view, it tends to reduce poverty because we consider their political incapacity. If a person doesn't have any awareness of politics or much awareness, if they, don't have, if they have very little confidence, if they have no political skills, they can't operate in the public sphere, and they have no connections, so they lack political capacity. This incapacity is one dimension of their poverty. It's not, poverty is not just about economics, it's about opportunities, capabilities, etc. And um, if you tackle that one, you tend to reduce poverty, if by poverty you mean political incapacity, uh, and also, by giving these people a better, sh a better chance to uh, in assert themselves in local arenas against prosperous people, you probably also uh, erode inequality. So, I mean, we're thinking along these lines. We have quite a lot of work still needs to be done. On this. Others are, are also looking at it. Um, all four of the, the cases that you've mentioned have examples where minority groups face disproportionate levels of poverty on the basis of ethnicity, religion, caste, etc. 
So, and actually, just the four examples you've just given about poverty reduction, I don't think that any of those naturally overcome the barrier of discrimination in terms of poverty reduction. They may mitigate a study like education, for example, but not eliminate that. So I was just interested in how the project might look at this, this factor. Uh, for example, on um, the lines of identities of the politicians that you're interviewing. And then the second thing I'm interested to hear more about is the methods of uh, the interviewing the politicians, because you said you want to get some of their hidden interests and bias. I'm wondering how, how this as a researcher do you do that? Well, we don't expect them to confess <coughs> straight out. I mean, we, we tend to uh, talk to them, but also talk to politicians, but also to a great many people who are sort of in and around the circle of politicians and build up a picture of what they do and what they've said and, and who they've associated with and uh, what they've opposed and all this sort of thing. And um, in, in the process, one can then build up a, a, a picture which, which probably gets at some of their inner preoccupations. To expect them to come straight out with them to take their words totally seriously would be a folly. Um, we will look at we will look at um, um, inequalities and also at poverty, which which is partly the result of social exclusion. In fact, social exclusion one one can argue that it's one dimension of a person's poverty if one is socially excluded. But we will look at that. Um, Carefully, we'll look at, at uh, religion, linguistic groups, um, ethnic. We don't like the word ethnic for complicated reasons because it tends to obscure more than it reveals, but uh, ethnic groups. Uh, and gender uh, is another aspect of this. Um, caste in India is certainly part of it, and I, I don't like the use, the use of the word ethnic to describe caste. It just, just causes more confusion than it reveals. Um, but I think that most of the, uh, the last three of the four types of initiative or goal uh, that I listed can actually uh, have quite a, uh, can have an, an impact on, on this kind of, um, on, on, poverty, on poverty or inequality in, when we consider the, the social exclusion dimension or the minority uh, dimension. I should say one thing, and that is that we think, um, this may not be good news from your point of view, by the way, but, but we, we think that um, identity politics, the uh, identities and politics, uh, identities have been, the importance of identities has been exaggerated by social scientists over the last 50 or 20 years, uh, especially in India, but also to some extent in, in uh, the other countries that we're looking at. Uh, and we, we think that, in fact, if we look carefully at what's actually been happening, we'll come to a, a conclusion that identities, identity politics are, are becoming less important, that they perhaps were always less important than we assumed, and that interests are increasingly tending to um, be more important than identities in um, determining how events play out and how processes like this play out. But the, there's a conference in Bangalore in June on this subject. Uh, sorry, there's a conference in uh, King's College London in June on this subject, where you should come and listen to the uh, ideas that will distress you but, but stimulate you at the same time. But I think probably there's a lot of substance in what in what the, what the argument in the argument that I just described. Yes, that was a little strange. Isn't it? To listen to uh, the project, and um, uh, there's was, was one thing that I was thinking a bit about when I heard this thing, uh, and this links up to the question about the relationship between poverty and um, inequality. And one thing you haven't said anything about is more the time dimension of this. But uh, is it something which is has to happen simultaneously. Uh, and when I think about the development in the Western world, I would think that we sometimes seem to lose track of, of how long time it actually takes. Uh, I think that we have seen, I'm from a small country in Norway, where you both have had lots of growth and lots of, uh, don't have lots of, yeah, you have lots of inequality. So, uh, 
And I think that, you know, to think that that has happened over the last 10 years or the last 20 years is a big mistake. I think that you went through 100 years maybe from uh, at least 1500 years. Norway was part, partly the most poor country in Europe about 150 years ago. And, uh, and for a long period of time it had a slow economic growth, but still steady economic growth, but increasing inequality. And I think in the last 50 years it's continued in economic growth, but much more had more and more uh, equality uh, as a result. And when I think about the Chinese, and they have extremely long-term plans, and people have told me that Deng Xiaoping made plans for how China should be in the world in 2050, and died in the 1990s, I think. And, uh, so, uh, and, and some people even say that they are still pursuing his plan. Uh, you know, having 20% of the GDP, 20% of trade and export, 20% of investment, and 20% of intellectual property rights by 2050 in the world. And so I, I think is that part of your project? Is it, the, is it something that, you know, how can you capture the time dimension on, on those two things? And is it fair that they should be considered simultaneously? Um, well, I, sh I should say that the decisions by the four governments to tackle poverty and inequality, uh, to emphasize this, um, the, the decisions by, by, by three of the four were uh, strangely simultaneous. It, that, that doesn't mean they had the same cause, and they certainly were not in contact with each other saying, shall we get both, both uh, adopt these policies at the same time? But in China, India, and, uh, and, and South Africa, Policy decisions were taken around about 2002, 2003, uh, which, uh, and in India, things really started to happen after mid 2004. Uh, so the, the, the decisions in those three countries uh, were taken at roughly the same time. But we don't think there's any kind of grand, deep structural explanation for this, a secret cause or something. We don't think that's true. In Brazil, they've been doing this since about 1994, three, four, five, uh, under President Cardozo, then under President Lula, and now under Lula's uh, successor. So in Brazil, they've been at it for a longer period. Um, in terms of economic growth, um, we have seen rapid economic growth makes significant differences to the economies of, of the three countries, especially to the economies of India and China. And that growth has really actually happened in a, over a fairly limited time span and, and started quite recently in three of the four countries. In China, it started earlier. It started in the early 1980s, after the policy changes in 1979, uh, under Deng Xiaoping, uh, following on the death of Mao Zedong, etc. But in India, you didn't start to get significant economic growth until around about 95, 96, because the economic liberalization in earnest began in 91. Uh, in South Africa, uh, they, were much, they were, were much more radical in their economic liberalization than the Indians. They gave the international market everything that the international market wanted, expecting money to pour in, and then it didn't. International capitalism betrayed the new South Africa. I think it continues to a significant degree to betray them. However, so that they had extremely low economic growth, 0.5% of GDP, which is below population growth, for, for several years in the late 1990s. But then they, they, they sort of they reached, things have improved in the, since 2001 to around 3 4% of GDP. Brazil um, has had significant and sustained economic growth only since the mid to late 1990s because they faced very serious um, economic uh, disarray, hyperinflation, etc. in the late 80s, the early 90s. Uh, so that actually it's only since the late 90s you've seen significant growth in Brazil and it's not anything like the levels that one sees in India and China. So, uh, but in a way the the economic growth stories in the three cases are, are quite recent stories and in terms of the real uh, pickup in, in growth and it's happened over a relatively short time. Actually, when people tell me about Europe, they say that your country is a place where it also happened uh, since, since the oil was discovered, that you've had a kind of short-term thing in, in Norway, but I'm not, let's not get into the Norway. Uh, I should just say that, that there's another um, common um, feature which uh, 
um, may be quite important in spurring the decisions to pursue uh, poverty reduction and, and, and um, the, an assault on inequality. And that is that it's around about 2003, 2002, 2003, you see a takeoff in government revenues and an, an, an increase in government revenues in, in the three of the four countries, uh, in, four, in all four countries actually. Um, and it's particularly marked in India, where you get in 2000, since 2003, uh, government revenues have increased 30% per year, compounded. You double your money every three years this way. And so, uh, but it, you know, similar increases have, have uh, existed in, in the other three countries. The South Africans, uh, again, are the laggards, and the government is a bit reluctant to impose taxation, which would bring in revenue, but they know they have the potential to bring in more revenue if they can ever persuade themselves to be something other than right of center. So, um, uh, it's, but this, the, the changes actually are reasonably recent when you compare them to the history of the industrialized Western democracies. Okay, and um, since that answer, I kind of got an additional bit to my question. And my primary question was around um, what are the different motivations at different levels of government? Um, and you said that primarily ideology doesn't really come into it. Um, but you've mentioned Porto Alegre where uh, they led on participatory budgeting and that was under the Workers' Party. Um, so I'm interested also to understand which elements uh, Cardozo introduced before Lula came in. Um, and as you've talked quite a lot about the South African case in response to the last question, um, my understanding is that a lot of the way their policy has been shaped has been influenced by um, structural adjustment programs that they've been under. Um, so I just wondered if you could comment on that. Yeah, if you want to know uh, what Cardozo did to tackle poverty and inequality, then I s suggest that you wait about three weeks and read a book called Against the Odds, which uh, uh, three of us have written, uh, including a Brazilian colleague of mine called Mello, Marcus Mello, in which he, he has a chapter on, on Cardozo which tells that story in excruciating detail. <laughs> so, uh, but he did a lot, I'll put it this way, he did a lot. Right? And then, then uh, what you had was a, a, a center-left party, the Social Democrats led by Cardozo, and a slightly further left party, the Workers' Party, or the PT led by Lula. They were in competition. It wasn't a vicious competition, but they were in competition to see who could come up with the most uh, imaginative and pre uh, progressive ideas. And in fact, both parties generated some quite important ideas, and, and it was often the competition also often occurred at municipal level, as in the case of Porto Alegre, or at the, or at the state level in the federal system. Uh, but it, there was a lot uh, that happened before Lula became president in 2002. So, I think it was 2002. So, um, we have to give credit to both both parties, I think. Um, I don't think the South Africans, uh, the South Africans have, when they've tied their hands in um, things that what we might call structural adjustment programs or something, um, they've tended to do it uh, of their own free will. They, you know, gave up all sorts of powers over the economy, which the government previously exercised. They did this after 1994. Uh, on the assumption um, that you know, international uh, investment would come pouring in because they were such a, a market-friendly kind of in place, and then it would come in. So, so they've um, miscalculated seriously, but I don't think that they were, I don't think this is a story of them being trapped and compelled by some kind of international agreement with the IMF or something. World Bank uh, to uh, that prevents them from being progressive. It's I, I think they are quite free to have, they have always been quite free to take a different path, and it's only in recent times that they've got serious uh, on most fronts about tackling poverty and inequality. It's it's only and it's not. Uh, I mean, Tabo and Becky had a personal. He was personally determined not to be, uh, uh, not to alienate market forces in the in the naive hope that they would actually, you know, come to his rescue, but they never did. Zuma doesn't have a view on 
He doesn't have a, he, he doesn't have a view about reducing poverty or inequality that's particularly strong. He doesn't have a view against it that's particularly strong. What Zuma does is he op opens up the, the cabinet, he opens up politics, he opens up politics within the ANC, and he says, look, people with good ideas, uh, come along, be ministers, be, be leaders in the party, and try your ideas out. And the reason we've seen an increase in poverty and inequality uh, programs in South Africa in recent times is that some entrepreneurial ministers have taken Zuma at his word and begun to introduce them. Um, I, I, it's always a bad idea for lawyers to start getting involved in <laughs> questions of economy or politics, and we, you know, we always get it wrong, so I, I, I apologize for, for, for doing this, but it seems, I think, as if I'm asking the same uh, question as the the lady in the corner over there, and so I'm going to ask it again, and <laughs> hoping to get uh, perhaps a different answer. Um, everything was fine until you got to the end, in, in which you you wanted to make a comparison between uh, these countries that you were studying and uh, and Western economies, uh, in order to make a point which I entirely agree with, but I didn't agree with the comparison because it seemed to me that the countries that you were looking at were countries, and it may be that this is really what you were saying, in the state of catching up. Whereas the countries of the West are maybe over mature, that we're facing um, the end of welfareism um, for all sorts of reasons, but whatever, that comparison just doesn't seem to me to work. Your, your conclusion, I entirely agree with, but not the comparison. Uh, well, you may be right. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think, um, in a way, we will only know if you're right when people other than my group of colleagues study the West and not the non-West. Uh, we will only know if you're right when we find out whether this really is the end of welfareism. Um, I, I have a strong suspicion that this is not the end of welfareism. What we're seeing in the West today is not uh, a situation in which it is completely unthinkable and infeasible to sustain welfare states but rather a, a situation in which um, a large number of political leaders have taken the, take the view that, that they, they must now uh, dismantle welfare states. And not, but but I, don't think, I don't think that, um, I think it may, this may exist in their minds more than in reality. I think we'll see, we, we do see uh, in, in uh, the Nordic countries, and in Canada, for example, we see um, welfare states being sustained without the collapse of economies. Um, sustained to a very considerable extent, despite squeezings and cuts and, or here and there, it's not terribly radical. Um, and the economies are actually in reasonably good nick by comparison to some of the others. So I'm not sure that it's the end of welfareism because some inexorable, irresistible force is now making it impossible to sustain welfare states. Uh, a lot of people think that's the case, but I think it may be they're thinking that it's the case rather than the reality that we're looking at. But we'll find, but we won't know uh, until we, you know, <clears throat> until people who study the West, which is something I don't do, uh, get an answer to that. So my comparison here is partly to make this uh, discussion a bit more relevant to um, uh, people who, around, the, around the room who don't necessarily study the third world. Uh, but it's also something, we, the comparison is something we're hearing from serious people in India, South Africa, and Brazil, not so much from China. They're, they're too polite these days in China. But, uh, um, and the view is, I think, needs to be taken seriously. Just, we need to be, think about it. We never read about it, but in, in the Western press. It's very strange. In the New York Times, which I read every day, you don't read about this sort of thing. And it's only very occasionally it crops up in a weird in publication like The Guardian. Okay, well, I, I think I'm going to draw this 
to a close, although I'm sure you're going to be here for a few more minutes if you want to uh, uh, to talk. It was uh, it was very enjoyable. Um, I wish you the uh, uh, enormous success in, uh, in taking this forward. Thank you very much for entertaining. I think this must be the largest dean's <laughs> seminar that I've managed to get to. Um, and uh, thank you very much for today. Thank you. Thank you.